crew member would you like to call? Make way for... Twayen! The Eternal Archer offers her aid! Approach quietly, strike back! Enter your breathing. Income. Welcome. Which weapon shall I strengthen? I can make any weapon you want. Temper in your weapons? Let me show you what my master has taught me. Perfect. Always strive to be stronger. Leave it to me. I went well. I'll unlock the power within. Take care. Even stronger. Love it. Ooh. Nice. Good. Love it. Nice. Ooh. Practice makes perfect. Good. Great. 
The twang of a bowstring. The cessation of a once beating heart. I knelt down quietly beside my prey and confirmed the absence of a pulse. There's no escaping the cold, ironclad law of this world that the strong devour the weak to survive. Growing up in a backwater hunting village, the adults ingrained this irrefutable rule into our brains from the moment we could crawl. Memories of my childhood raced into my head as I wrestled the arrow from flesh and sinew. Back then, my friend and I would often trek into the perilous wilderness to compete for the largest catch. Although no records of our matches were ever kept, I can assure you that I never lost once. I had the sharpest eyes in the entire village, bar none. When I stood atop a mountain summit, not a single beast escaped my gaze. Yep, I sure was proud of my eyesight when I was a kid. Everyone in the village showered me with praise. They all agreed I was a natural-born hunter. A generational talent, even. Now, I'm not going to lie. I might have let it go to my head a little. Before I realized it, my bonds with the villagers began to fray. My world, the village, felt suffocating. I took to hunting on my own as a means of improving my survival skills. To learn to be self-sufficient. Before long, I left the village behind. As someone who could pinpoint a pin in a sea of silver, the ends of the skies remained opaque to me. Oh, how I desired to know what lay beyond the shroud. I wanted to be able to see halfway around the world from where I stood. Was that so weird? Striding into my first real city was a moment unlike any other. Where did all the people come from? While my mouth feasted on savory delights, my eyes took in the vivid sights. Like a pup opening her eyes for the first time, I was flooded with wonder. What a mess of nerves and excitement I must have been. For the better part of a week, I worked tirelessly to blend in with the crowd. Couldn't let anyone find out I was a country bumpkin. The transition was seamless. I even established quite a few friendships. Life in the city was a delight. Until reality finally caught up to me. One day, a colossal beast broke past the city gates. In an instant, I fired my bow with the goal of taking one life to save many. With nary a twitch, the interloper went down in a silent heap, my arrow protruding from the center of its brow. It was so quiet, I thought time had stopped. None dared breathe, let alone speak. Suddenly, the entire square erupted with cheers and applause. For the first time since my arrival, I wasn't simply another face in the crowd. Riding the high, I instinctively went about field-dressing the kill, right in front of everyone. Can you blame me? Its meat and hide would have made such fabulous gifts for the city folk. Oh, I was so naive back then. You can take the girl out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the girl. The warm reception I had won turned absolutely frosty. From the moment I made the first incision, I realized my faux pas, but it was already too late. Friends with whom I'd stayed up many a night swapping stories over food and drink instantly severed ties with me and began to gossip behind my back. In the blink of an eye, I'd lost everything. That was the day I received my first bitter taste of isolation. It's hard to identify exactly when the cynicism set in, when I started to view myself as a monster. Things are so much simpler when you're a kid. I was happy as the village's top archer, and that was that. Then I stepped outside my little bubble and was never the same again. From the new locales I visited to the strange beasts I shot down, every new experience filled me with ever-growing doubt. I questioned if there was anyone in the Sky Realm capable of matching my marksmanship. 
I was still proud of my hunting prowess, but the prospect of standing alone at the top left me feeling conflicted. When you're the best of the best with zero competition, who else can you relate to? The thought of total isolation terrified me the most. At times, my yearning for camaraderie bordered on the obsessive. It wasn't like I had to find a rival who was my equal in skill. I just wanted to meet someone who saw me for who I was. There had to be at least one person out there I could confide in, share my secrets with. Sadly, most folks I met on my travels took one look at my freak talents and refused to give me the time of day. Some were kind enough to at least pretend to like me. We'd spend time together, sharing pleasantries and laughs. I nearly fell into the trap of believing I was normal, until the fear hiding in their eyes betrayed the truth. These people stared back at me like cornered animals fearing a predator who was merely playing with our food. I began to blame myself, and grew too afraid to even give them a passing hello. Then, I finally met someone who genuinely understood what I was going through. Her name was Silva. She was a master sniper in her own right, and didn't give two hoots that I wasn't normal. We did everything as best friends, eating out, shopping, the works, Whew, the bags of rubies I must have spent. Now I'd been burned before, but this time, this time things were going to be different. <sighs> when will I learn not to get my hopes up? You see, Silva was hired for this routine bodyguard gig. Nothing fancy. But it all fell apart when suddenly her VIP came under attack from a horde of monsters. I saw the ambush unfold from leagues away, and without a second thought drew back my bowstring again and again. As the last of the brutes fell from my arrows, Silva stood trembling amid the carnage, her mouth agape. She's a monster, my supposed friend uttered. Of course I couldn't hear her words over such a vast distance, but I read it on her lips, clear as day. I'd been called that countless times by countless people. The words should have held no power over me, but... This time, it had hit differently, coming from someone I considered to be my first best friend. From that day on, we pretty much drifted apart. But I guess fate had other plans for us. When I joined the captain on their travels, I was shocked to learn that the woman I'd been trying so hard to avoid was also part of the crew. Silva and I finally sat down and had a heart-to-heart -to, -heart to clear the air, and when you know it, both of us were guilty of misjudging the other, and of acting like babies. Silva apologized for what she had said on that fateful day, even though it was totally my fault for jumping to conclusions. Hearing my first real friend speak from the heart brought me to tears. I think it was at that point when I realized I wasn't alone anymore. There was someone else standing right beside me, someone I could rely on through thick and thin, the monster who had been sentenced to a life of isolation was at long last free of her prison. There are ten of us that make up the Eternals. We're said to be the strongest fighters wielding the strongest weapons in the skies. Our formidable presence alone was enough to deter conflict before it arose, so rarely did I need to draw an arrow. I joined the Eternals because I agreed with their mantra of solving disputes without bloodshed, but on a personal level, I just wanted to spend time with others who knew the pain of being ostracized for being atypical. So imagine my dismay when I discovered their penchants for being antisocial. We don't even go out for dinner together. What's up with that? Well, everyone's got their own thing going, I guess. But it's a shame we don't indulge in our hobbies together. Not all hope is lost, though. A lot of us have really opened up since we started traveling with the captain's crew. 
Speaking of the crew, I wonder how they're doing right now. Last time I saw them was before they left for Zega Grande Skydom. And according to the latest gossip from Anra's merchant contacts, the region was experiencing a massive uprising. When Sovan heard the news, of course he leapt into action and headed there himself. Sovan's a principled man, but sometimes he can be blinded by zeal. Like the time the Seven Star Sword manipulated him into attacking his fellow Eternals. Yep, including me. So, I thought I should go and keep an eye on him. It wasn't that I was worried about him, per se. Better to have extra help on hand should complications develop, you know? Besides, I was doing this as a favor to Anra, too. And as long as I was making excuses, I might as well confess. Although I never miss my target, I certainly miss the captain and the crew. Upon my arrival in Zega Grande, the crew introduced me to Id, one of their newest acquaintances. He'd been at the eye of the storm, and it wasn't hard to see he was talented. He was equally as strong as the captain. No, perhaps he had a higher ceiling. Sovan gave a big smile as he shook hands with Id, but I felt the crackle of tension in the air. Meanwhile, Id struck me as a troubled youth. Something about his mannerisms led me to believe that he too had suffered unfairly because of his power. He would have fit right in as the 11th member of the Eternals. Would it be alright if I lent a hand with your handyman tasks? Now that I was here, I decided to make myself useful. Maybe then I'd gain more insight into Id's constant self-reproach, learn the meaning behind those words he so often spoke. I must atone for the crimes I've committed. As the story went, the Church of Avia sought to throw this Skydom into chaos, and Id had served as one of its generals. Yet as far as I could tell, the people of Folka seemed to have already forgiven him, and were treating him as one of their own. This swordsman had made sacrifices for the well-being of others, and he appeared determined to continue doing so. I couldn't imagine anyone accusing him for not atoning enough. But in fact, there was one person capable of it. It himself. When I heard about the dragon power that had been sealed in his body, I felt a cold chill go through my own. A fear and uncertainty. For him, it's a burden he'll have to bear for the rest of his life.
One day, Sovan and Id were called away on an emergency mission to exterminate monsters. After Sovan came back, he didn't look happy. His power is a ticking time bomb. You want to live with endless guilt after he goes off? Because I don't. Whatever threat he saw in Id seemed to have rattled him. I didn't want to dismiss Sovan's misgivings outright, but the captain was a good judge of character. We needed to take our time getting to know Id. I'm going to withhold judgment and trust what my eyes show me. Suddenly, Sovan motioned for me to zip it. His eyes darted from side to side. Then he left without a word. How odd. Had someone been eavesdropping on us? At any rate, I had to step up my surveillance on Id. And what better way to stick close to Id without raising suspicion than by joining the Fix-It team? Now when Id said he did everything, he was not exaggerating. I giggled at the thought of the stone-faced bruiser tackling some of these jobs. Monster slaying? Of course. Finding a missing dog? I could see him doing that. Dishing out love advice? Oh, to be a fly on that wall. Helping the townspeople was a welcome break from the family Zothba's incessant interviews. To think the Eternals' exploits have made it this far west. Anra and Sovan sure know how to leverage our brand. As Zothba likes to say, business is business. I shared info about the Eternals. He gave me the scoop on it. Turns out, his home on Dolly Island was destroyed in a catastrophe 15 years ago. In the aftermath, he found himself adopted by the church, along with other foster brothers and sisters. Knowing that he hadn't grown up alone was of some relief to me, though I couldn't exactly tell you why. Regardless, I kept hacking away at the ever-expanding list of errands demanded of a handyman. One day, Id set out on an emergency request. And this time I followed. We'd come to Dolly, his old stomping grounds. From my vantage point in the air, I scanned the vast, sweeping desert with my monstrous eyes until I spotted our client amid a gaggle of fiends. It! Move to your nine! Hurry! My partner charged forward while I secured the rear. Uh, I'm saved! <sighs> that was a little too close. As I tried to calm the shaking woman, I noticed a haphazard trail of loose boxes and cartons leading away from us, no doubt created during her desperate attempt to flee. I'll go collect your cargo. It, will you stay here and... I was turning to look his way just as he cleaved a monster leaping out of the sand. He simply nodded back. <laughs> I think I was becoming a fan. Alrighty then. Time for this archer to wrap things up with a great big bow. My associate Id will keep you safe while I collect your stuff. Be right back. Uh, okay. Thank you. Go on. I got this. Watch it, Twayan! Be careful! <laughs> These pups are in for a rough time. Let's start with the first piece. Mm. Alrighty, on to number two. Snake's alive! It's alive! <laughs> Looks like this one is history. I sure hope nothing's happened to our merchant while we were gone. I I wouldn't worry too much about that. She's got the best bodyguard around. Look up, look up! They're above you! <laughs> Not to worry. I'll take them all out in one foul swoop. <laughs> As the saying goes, birds of a feather die together. Oh my. Uh -huh. Now for the third. Hmm? Everything. Ah, sweet! 
Ambush. Get away. You feed. No! Help me. Come on. Covering. Woo! Sent by nothing like having your own hand to hold the fort. Even shadows won't hide you. Here goes. Seeing any more foes. Thank goodness. Um, are you sure that guy's on the level? You saw him turn into that monster too, didn't you? There was that word again. It's all right. You have nothing to worry about. We'd slain every last enemy and secured the woman's safety, but that did nothing to soothe her nerves. I caught Id's gaze for the briefest instant before he quickly looked away. He's not your enemy, he's a friend. He used his power in order to keep you safe. It was no use. Prejudice had already clogged her ears. Sorry. With a subdued apology, Id turned on his heel and headed for the ship. This likely wasn't the first time he'd experienced persecution, nor would it be the last. Once Id left the scene, the client seemed to snap out of her hysteria. I'm sorry, I, I don't know what came over me. I felt compelled to say something, but my mind drew a blank. The woman opened her mouth to speak, though nothing came out. In the end, she simply kept her eyes glued to the spot where it had stood. Change wasn't going to happen overnight, but I chose to be optimistic. Hello. Have a good day.
day. As we pulled into Fulka, I saw a throng of people lined up along the dock awaiting Id's return. Some jumped up and down while others waved in jubilation. There were a few grumpy faces in the crowd, though I'm not sure why. Unlike Id, they weren't afraid of expressing their emotions. The man of the hour himself was taken aback by the hero's welcome. Nevertheless, I saw a sliver of a smile creep across his face. He'd touched the hearts of many serving as Folka's handyman. Not a single one of the grateful residents saw him as a monster. Having had the pleasure of working with Id, I was able to draw several conclusions. He wasn't big on words, and when he did speak, it was shortened to the point. Yet he never brandished his attitude with the intention of causing harm. I sensed no bitter embers of resentment smoldering within him. Nor did I sense a deep-seated grudge for the hand he was dealt. His positive reputation stood as a testament to his unwavering resolve. Be that as it may, Sovan was correct in treating Id's destructive power as a threat. People who didn't know him would easily mistake his power as a tool for evil, and that's before it had even reached its fullest potential. Right. The Dali Catastrophe. According to Roland, the force that devastated Dolly over a decade ago now courses through Id's veins. That power of destruction had already carved its place in history. The future is not mine to predict. However, I am an Eternal, and I have an obligation to ensure that the world remains at peace. Dolly was empty. Not that I expected visitors. My only company was the occasional gust of wind that blew in to kick up dust. In the hubbub of trying to keep the client safe, I hadn't had the chance to soak in the scenery. Broken structures from the disaster 15 years ago lay half buried amid the ruins, like sunken ships in a sea of sand. I spotted a rusted seesaw forced to retire from ever lifting another gleeful passenger. A sigh escaped my lips. After cresting a dune, I came to a stop and reflected on my own mission. How was I supposed to handle Id from the perspective of the Eternals? Was I to judge this man so beloved by his community, simply because he harbored the potential for catastrophe? I was so lost in thought that I didn't realize I wasn't alone anymore. This used to be my neighborhood. What was he holding? Flowers? Oh. These. Turns out he made frequent trips to Dolly to pay respect to the Fallen. Lilith found me here. My real parents were probably... already... He looked down at his feet as he continued. This wasteland is Versa's legacy. The dragon that was sealed within me. And now his power and I are inseparable. It himself wasn't to blame for the catastrophe. That much I knew for certain. But with such devastation quietly resting within him, it was hard to let things slide. Not to mention, he did have a record of going berserk before joining the crew. Power and responsibility go hand in hand. I had to make a decision soon. There's nothing inherently wrong about wanting to get stronger. But when you're blasting away entire villages with the snap of a finger, that's where I draw the line. In the beginning, I saw a bit of myself in it. People shunned my extreme abilities, and I retreated into my shell because of it. He, however, had a strong support system in place to prop him up. 
It hurts to admit that I was once beguiled by my own weapon, the Two Crown Bow. It as he is right now wouldn't have fallen for that trickery. Still, I had to be sure. Hey, mind if I ask you something? Let's say you were facing down the ultimate villain, and the only way to win was to lose yourself to the dragon's power. Would you take that chance? If that's what it takes to save lives, then yeah. I'd use that power in a heartbeat. So he was ready to put his life on the line for others. Good to know. After a short pause, he added a caveat. Because even if worse comes to worst, I know the captain will knock me on my ass if I screw up. With that, he stared off into the desert sky, which seemed to stretch into eternity. I couldn't help but smile. Winning people over when you're on an entirely different playing field is no easy feat. Believe me, I know. He'll tolerate the jeers, the scorn, and the acrimony, but he'll never tolerate his failure to help others. It was finally clear what I had to do. Good maintenance. Breathe calmly, and the bow will take care of the rest. Upon my return to Seed Hollow, a member of the family, Zothba, dropped off a letter for me, and I wasted no time in reading it. I could feel the author's disdain in every word. I hereby challenge Twayan of the Eternals to a duel. You can't hide your plot against it from me! Meet me at Seed Hollow Castle, now! Former commander of the Silver Wolf Corps, Galanta. Um... Okay? Not sure who this Galanza person was, but we both knew it, apparently. Hmm. I smelled a trap. On the other hand, if it was involved in some way, then I had no choice but to investigate. When I arrived at the castle, a domineering draft motioned me over. Well, well. You must be Twayan. As soon as I gave him a curt nod, he leveled his spear at me. He was definitely the mysterious author of that letter. I knew you wouldn't leave me hanging. He roared with laughter, eyes fixed on me like daggers. You mentioned a plot against it. Would you care to elaborate? Suddenly, the man wasn't laughing anymore. He accused the Eternals of plotting to assassinate it whom he saw as a younger brother. So Sovan's instincts had been right. There had been someone eavesdropping on our conversation. Now that I think about it, that was around the time the family Zothla started peppering me with questions. We should have been more careful before speaking so candidly. Still, the discussion to eliminate it had occurred before we had all the facts. I needed to clear this up. This is all a misunderstanding. Galanza snorted and readied his weapon. Anything I had to say would be a waste of breath. I knew the type. Too proud to admit wrongdoing. The only language they understood was combat. All right, Buster. Your funeral. Step on up! It's time for the death match of your lives! You better bring it! Don't expect me to go easy on you. Nobody paints a target on his head to get away with it. Nobody. 
you get in your way? Don't bring your crack to my sky of eternal! The Eternals don't disappoint! For someone in such hot water, you don't seem to feel the heat at all. Marshall Spear! You face did nothing to stop him from being murdered. <laughs> Wipe it out! Look upon our 
is one of my top five hardest fights. The two mysterious attackers were on the ropes, but they hadn't lost their spirit. It's gonna mop the floor with you. You should have brought every Eternal with you if you wanted to stand a chance. I'd sleep better if we could have at least taken one of them out. It wasn't the loss itself they lamented, but rather their inability to protect someone important to them. I was relieved to know they weren't bad people. So I did the only thing I could think of to defuse the tension. I smiled. As I was trying to say before, this is a big misunderstanding. I'm on your side, and I intend to stand up for it. Once they realized I wasn't going to take their heads, they finally decided to believe me. There was only one hurdle left in Id's way, and its name was Sovan. Need something? I tracked down the captain in Seed Hollow and gave them the rundown. Perhaps uncoincidentally, Sovan and Id were both missing. Visions of a bloodbath flooded my mind, and I admonished my overactive imagination. We had to find those two before grave mistakes were made, ones that could never be corrected. Unfortunately for us, Sovan did a stellar job of covering his tracks. His precautions proved that this time, he meant business. What we needed was a clue. Informa- Oh. There was an entire business devoted to gathering intel right here in Seed Hollow. How could I forget? They were the ones who facilitated the castle duel in the first place. I figured I was owed a favor for having to deal with that inconvenience. The captain and I entered Zothba's tavern right as an informant returning from Folka was reporting on the whereabouts of our missing boys. The family still held open distrust for the Eternals, but as always, the captain put in a good word for me. We rushed to Einstedo Archipelago. What would have taken dozens of spotters hours to comb the chain of islands, I surveyed in seconds. There they were, in Skyworm Valley! Hard to miss the flash of sparks erupting off of clashing steel. That's enough! I fired an arrow that landed squarely between the two, stopping them in their tracks. The surprise on Sovan's face dissipated in a split second. He knew the jig was up. Sovan didn't know it, nor had I felt the need to tell him, but Anra gave me special instructions before coming to Sega Grande. If our leader decided to take matters into his own hands, the duty to stop him fell to me. There's little Sovon can't fix, given how strong he is. I fully expect him to try and solve everything by himself. Now that's weird. No one consulted me about dragging it out into the wilderness to murder him. <sighs> Don't get me wrong, Sovon. I know the responsibility of keeping the world safe is a heavy one. I should have done more to talk things out with you, so we could come up with a solution that would please everybody. But as the saying goes, all's well that ends well. Maybe now we can finally set aside our differences and have an honest chat over a warm meal. Ah, 
Ash, thanks for taking the time to come talk to me. I was kind of hoping to make an apology to it today. The same woman who had been terrified of her savior had hired me to give her advice. Imagine that. Me, a counselor. If I ever got tired of the Eternals gig, I think I'd make a great Miss Fixit. Case in point, my master plan was about to come to fruition. Sorry to keep you waiting. What? What's he doing here? An awkward silence followed as the woman looked at me, pleading for a lifeline. Nope, you're on your own. But I did give her an encouraging smile. Got plenty of those. Realizing my lips were sealed, the woman timidly faced it. She gathered her courage and spoke from the heart. She expressed regret for the abuses she had hurled at her rescuer. She'd been trying to find the nerve to apologize ever since. Little by little, she laid bare her true feelings. I'm mortified by my appalling behavior. Please accept my heartfelt apologies. And the next time I need a bodyguard, the job's all yours. I won't hire anyone but you. The sudden change in the woman's demeanor was as evident as the surprise on Id's face. Uh, sure. Thanks. Oh. Was that a hint of pink I saw in his cheeks? Well, I was an archery expert, not a people expert. I never knew what to say at times like these. It's interesting how the little things can spur big changes in our relationships with others. Watching new bonds form in real time was a treat. Sometimes, all it takes for two hearts to beat in harmony is the twang of a bowstring. Twain, can you see into the future? <laughs> Who's to say? Personally, I'd say he hit the bullseye. Please come again. <laughs>